Yeah, thanks everyone for coming today to Super Chief Gallery. I'm so excited to be here to talk about Web3 and crypto wallets. And I want to thank MetaMask um, for you know, sponsoring this event. You know, education is so key to understanding the space and I think moving it forward. And just a brief background about me and how I became interested in Web3. Um, I work at Pace Gallery. I have been there for 11 years and I am started out in logistics um, and now I'm a director there. And I specialize in um, media arts, which is kind of an umbrella term for time-based media, you know, performance art, digital, and software-based art. And you know, I've worked with video artists for over 10 years. And you know, let's say it comes on like a thumb drive or an SD card, um, and you know, and you're you're sending it or you're retransferring a file, and you're just sending it out and you have a contract. So I have a lot of experience working with legal teams. And um, you know, you know, how do you know if it's been saved or archived or reproduced an infinite amount of times? How do you know it's not being displayed long after the agreement has expired? Um, so really it got me thinking like, how do we really protect artists? How do we protect the integrity of their artwork? And furthermore, if you know, their artwork is being displayed and resold without us knowing, um, you know, how does that infringe on their ability to generate revenue? So um, when I first learned about blockchain, it was probably like 2017. And so I'm going to talk about blockchain, you know, deeper into the conversation. Um, I saw this as like a solution to protecting, you know, digital artwork. So um, my background is in art, but we're going to talk about all the different use cases. Um, and but first off, I want to kind of see what everyone's knowledge level is. Um, ha have you guys, uh, what is an NFT? Does anyone know? Were you? <laughs> Pass. Um, does anyone, has anyone bought crypto or sold crypto? Okay. Um, do you, anyone own any, any, any NFTs? Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> when, when did you guys first hear like the word NFT? You guys excluded. 2020? So it's probably with this really infamous sale of Beeble's work, A Thousand Days. Um, th this is, you know, after this happened, I remember my mom calling me and she was like, Raina, I saw on CNN that in something called an NFT sold for like $70 million. And I was like, oh my God, my mom knows what an NFT is now. Um, so, you know, this really, I think, helped in one way, like, like really make it widespread knowledge, like what is an NFT? Um, and uh, I think that's when a lot of people started paying attention to it, in particular the art world, which again is my background and expertise. So I wanna just briefly kind of talk about like how we got to Web3. Um, you know, when the advent of the internet kind of happened, it really was in the early 90s. And that's when you have, um, you know, basically web pages, which were like read-owned static pages that you could read and digest. Um, and the 2000s is really when it became more interactive and kind of a read-write read, web. Um, and, but, you know, web one is about like showing and presenting information. Uh, web two, and just to go back, so you guys have all remembered dial-up, right? <laughs> um, you know, people born in like 90s, yeah, and uh, later, um, you know, they're like, what? You couldn't be on the phone and the internet at the same time? So I just wanted to have these like, old school, you know, of all the cables needed and all of that. Um, so anyways, Web2 is basically how we understand the internet today and how it's mainly being used. Um, social media is obviously key. That's really when we um, that began the virtual social interaction of chatting, um, being able to, to comment and communicate with others. Uh, also this idea of like the role of the influencer, um, you know, starts to take place as well. And you have major companies like YouTube, Wikipedia, and Google, um, which you know, expanded our ability to watch, learn, search, and communicate. Um, and that's when you could also comment on content and share it as well. But Web2 is really the era of centralization, right? It's dominated by these massive companies um, that provide right, free services. But this is an exchange for our personal data. And this really didn't come to light until, I mean, I, I 
And be like the whole like Trump election, Cambridge Analytics, you know, like that our personal data was being used and sold. And we're basically, um, you know, that's where our targeted ad economy started. So basically, that's when people started thinking about, you know, how can we take ownership over our data? Uh, and so Web3 is really the concept of the next generation of the web, uh, which will be a decentralized network and where we can have access to our own data. So this vision includes, you know, blockchain based web um, services, which, um, you know, is a technology used for cryptocurrencies, NFTs, uh, decentralized finance and more. We're going to get into like more of this as we go. I do want to say, like, if you have any questions as I'm talking, just feel free to like shout it out. We're going to do kind of a brief overview and then dive deeper. So, you know, it might be a little dense at first, but, you know, we're going to get into it. We're going to do like actual simulations. And if you don't have a MetaMask wallet, we can set that up together as well. Um, so, it, you know, it offers a read, write and own version of the web um, and gives us more control. So basically, advocates of Web3 are arguing that it's creating new economies, new class of products and new online services and is like the return of democracy to the web. We know when the internet first you know, came to be, it was about access to information. Um, and it was almost an anarchist movement, right? Uh, and so now this is like um, the era of ownership or value in a sense. The first blockchain was launched in 1991. Bitcoin was launched um, in 2009. And, you know, after, you know, kind of a decade of it, we're in this new era of Web3, which has dawned. Um, I think MetaMask, I'm not going to read this verbatim. You guys read on the screen. But I think they kind of state this really beautifully, that Web3 is an umbrella term for the vision of a better Internet, an Internet with added identity, money and social layer. Um, it builds upon protocols that value transparency and innovation and siphons power away from big corporations and places us at the helm of our data. Um, so it's a shift from an Internet of information to an Internet of value. Uh, so basically the key components, you know, decentralization, cryptocurrency, NFTs, AI, blockchain technology and metaverse worlds. So we're going to get into, you know, all of this later. I guess one thing just to point out, point out uh, I did a run through of this with my mom earlier today. <laughs> today she's in town visiting and, uh, you know, she didn't know that cookies were like how your personal data is tracked. And every time you log on to website, you have to like accept it now. Um, so fun side note, I guess. So, you know, what is blockchain technology, right? It's a continuous ledger uh, or record of data. Um, it's stored on a network of computers. So basically, there's a network of computers all over the world where like when you go to transact on the blockchain, um, it sends like a puzzle that miners are called like miners, um, you know, like scrambled to solve as soon as possible. And so that's what makes it decentralized, right? It's not like one company or corporation that holds all the data. Also, most recently, um, there's been some images that came out of like Texas, like power plants being taken over by like thousands of computers, um, you know, that are you know, all mining transactions. Basically, every transaction is a record on the blockchain. So one transaction equals one record on the blockchain and it's immutable. Um, so once it's there, it's kind of there forever and can't be changed. Um, it's also transparent, which I think is also very key to Web3, um, that all the recording data is public knowledge. And we're going to go over like how you can see that public knowledge. Um, and it's also, you know, it's secure. Uh, it's a very complex encrypt encryption algorithmic kind of system. Uh, so, we're, I mean, we're going to get into this a little bit deeper, but if you want to send, you know, like money to someone, um, you know, as an example, um, the transaction is represented as a block. It gets distributed to the network, as I was just describing. Um, each of those networks kind of verifies it and then it gets added to the chain and becomes a permanent record. And that's when ownership or value or whatever it is you're transferring is then um, sent and then recorded forever. And just the popular kind of blockchains and their cryptocurrencies. I mean, the most popular is Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, Bitcoin, you know, is a fungible token. Um, Ethereum 
allows for, um, you know, obviously Ethereum, Ether, uh, but also NFTs, like non-fungible tokens, meaning like that data can't be changed. So what is an NFT? <laughs> um, basically, you know, it's a, um, a unique digital asset that's stored and recorded on the blockchain and generated by self-executing contracts. I think that's the other key component here is the smart contracts. It can be different formats like JPEG or movie or PNG. It can also represent digital or real world items like artworks or even real estate, which is how it's being used today. Um, it's the, you know, just some terms to go along with it. Uh, the act of creating an NFT is called minting. Um, minting dates are often referred to as drops or launches. And once an NFT is minted, it is then governed by a smart contract that the creator, or if you're creating an NFT, you decide the terms. So it's a self-executing contract uh, between the buyer and seller. It's directly written into the code and you can set any rule for the transaction. It can be dictated by whomever. It's flexible and automatic. I like to compare it to like an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> you know, like if you just put in a formula and hit sum, it automatically, you know, processes the whole thing. That's the way the smart contract works as well. And they're getting more and more thorough. Uh, so here are just some of the use cases for blockchain. You know, we've already discussed the creation of digital artworks and NFTs, um, AI art, generative art, um, the creation of digital scarcity, I think also is key um, because when you have an NFT, it has this unique ID code associated with it, right? Because I think a lot of um, the, what people criticize about an NFT is like, oh, well, I can right click save. Like you probably all heard that. My mom said that to me a million times, you know, but with this, it, it shows that you have this provable addition that can be sold and transferred. And again, working with digital artists, this is really like key to understanding what's the original artwork or file. Um, again, to authenticate, provide provenance, it allows for fractional ownership. Um, so multiple people can have, you know, different stakes in different objects. Um, smart contracts and then I think royalties and copyright verification is super key. Um, you know, in just in the art market in general, uh, if you sell, if an artist, you know, or the gallery sells an artwork to a collector and then the collector resells it, the artist gets nothing from that, like secondary market sale. And often it's sold for, for more. Um, same thing with auction houses. So NFTs um, you know, allow you as the artist or creator to then uh, get, you know, royalties built in indefinitely. And normally that ranges between 2.5 to like 10%. So like, you know, why, why use it? Um, I think we've gone over art, uh, you know, quite a lot. That's my area of expertise, but you know, there's finance. Um, it's given millions of unbanked people free access. Um, it's helped a lot of people in countries around the world get money, um, put things on, uh, you know, on blockchain and be able to make a living, you know, out of that as well. Um, identity, you control your identity and reveal what parts that you want people to know about it. We're going to talk more about identity later on. Um, ownership, uh, it proves that you own this digital item. Um, it's also, you know, trading cards or tickets are becoming a big thing. Um, games and, you know, music, I think, is also really, you know, taking off on it. Um, and then community, you know, when you, a lot of DAOs, um, they, you know, you, it's like becomes like a membership card to get into different events um, around the world or residencies. So, yeah, I mean, digital payments, um, freedom from intermediaries like big banks and big, pet, big tech, uh, distribution of power and agency, direct over ownership over your identity, content and assets, which I think is very key, um, transparency and, uh, you know, the ability to build on top of other applications to make the whole ecosystem whoop, uh, more valuable. So crypto wallet. So how many people here have a crypto wallet already. Nice. Hey, Ed. <laughs> um, which wallet do you have? MetaMask. Meta 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 <laughs> okay. Are you the only one without one? MetaMask? Do you have a MetaMask wallet? Okay, well, if you want to set it up um, while we're going through it, 
you know, feel free, we can do that. Um, so, I mean, I feel like you guys already understand this, right? Like traditional wallets, like in our pocket, we have our license, um, maybe an insurance card, we have credit cards, all of that, right? That can all be, you know, digital. Um, and, you know, eventually, like, you know, down, down the road, it could be something where like our birth certificates, our health records, our school records, like everything could be on the blockchain and validated and we can see, we can, you know, tell who gets access to what information. Um, so, you know, they help you manage your per permissions and who you share your data with and also store crypto and NFTs as well. So your wallet is for storing and managing your identity represented by digital keys. So you need this to do anything on the blockchain, um, buy and sell art, trade it, connect to adapt. Um, and the moment your crypto wallet is created, you, as you guys probably know, you uh, have to, you'll get like this generated secret recovery phase, which we'll go into like a little bit deeper. Um, and this seed is what your digital public address is. That's what like is given out into the world. So that's um, allows you to, again, like buy crypto or trade it or transfer it or buy NFTs. Um, and this is really the public address is the first way to have an identity on the blockchain. I think we can't emphasize this enough, and I feel like this feels so ironic to say, but like your seed phase, a phrase is <laughs> you want to write it down with like a pen on paper and put it in a safe. Um, because if you lose that, like you can't remember your password and you lose your seed fra phrase, um, you'll never be able to get in it again. You'll never have access to your assets or crypto. It's gone forever. There's no one that can hack it and get it open. You have to start all over again. Yes, yeah. And I've, I know very many people that, <laughs> that have done this. Um, and you need, like, if you open multiple accounts, each of those accounts has its own number. Um, so, or seed, seed phrase and number. So I write everything down with the account number. Um, and I also have different accounts on my mobile versus my... Um, laptop as well. Most of you, do you want to set up your wallet today? Um, okay, well, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> it won't work, okay. We're going to do some simulations. We're, okay, let's do it right now. Um, but basically, I mean, it's pretty... Uh, um, it's really straightforward to, like, follow all the steps and download it. Um, and then once you have it, again, you can buy crypto swap tokens, you can send crypto around the world, you can trade in your crypto for USD, you can buy NFTs and visit sites. So actually, I wanna do this with mine. So I'm going to OpenSea because it's the largest marketplace. I'll make it bigger. Um, and so when you log into it, there's a button right here that says connect your wallet. So I'm gonna go ahead and connect mine. It's asking me for my password. And you know, this whole process can be like a little temperamental, to be <laughs> exactly. honest. Like it's, uh, you know, it's, you know, do research, you know, make, like MetaMask site is so thorough. Um, you know, look at credible resources. There's tons of articles coming out, but like, you know, I would say have, have patience because it definitely can, can feel like, um, okay, here we go. So we logged on. Um, so these are, this is what shows up in my wallet on my computer. Um, and so now that I'm connected, um, you know, I had to sign into it and then approve that I could connect to it. Um, so I also want to, while we're on this page, um, you know, you can go through the transaction history like we were talking about and see like what things sold for, what they were minted for. Ah. All right, well, this page is working. All right, we'll, do, we'll just go back with this. All right, so you choose your account that you want to connect with. Um, and then you get to go to the, you know, marketplace. If you want to buy crypto. Um, you know, it will, you can have the choice of Bitcoin, or Ethereum, you can do it via Apple Pay, instant bank transfer or a debit or credit card. 
although I'm not here to give you financial advice, I would say maybe not use a credit card. <laughs> but your choice, you have the option to do it. Um, it will tell you how much, you know, ETH you're buying. Um, it will give you quotes or different like providers that can access it. One might be higher or lower, so you can just choose one. Um, there you go. Then you get your crypto and it happens within seconds, as you just saw. Um, maybe a couple minutes if there's like a lot of people transacting at the same time. But I think a big key difference is that with banks, you know, it takes days for money to transfer. We're here. It's almost instantaneously. Um, so to send crypto. So you have basically a receive button, which to receive is the public address that we talked about um, that allows you to receive crypto and NFTs, um, the buy, which we just did, and then the send. Um, so you will see, you can like scan the QR code um, and your MetaMask, there's also a way to like copy the public address number. Let's say I wanna give 250 to my mom. Um, and there you go, again, within, within seconds. Uh, yeah, and again, OpenSea, it's, you know, the largest NFT like marketplace, but really it's just aggregating data from all the other marketplaces that exist, right? Like there's things on chain and off chain, like most NFTs, it's the record of the receipt of you buying it, but it points to like another database, right? Um, so there are things that can be on chain where the, the image or whatever is actually on chain, but most of the time it's off chain. Um, so. I and OpenSea will like anything you bought from like Foundation or Voice or Maker's Place, like that will all show up on OpenSea. And here's just some of the, the marketplaces I wanted to highlight. Um, the first dark blue box with like crypto art and Maker's Place and Rarible, OpenSea, anyone can go on and mint an NFT with these marketplaces. Um, the Nifty Foundation, super rare, you have to be invited to participate on that. So it's, um, more curated. I'll say that loosely. I'm also an independent curator <laughs> and writer. Um, you know, I will say the, like, not to get off topic, but, um, you know, like when you mint something on these marketplaces, you don't know, like, where, if you're on, like, the front page, like, who, what artist you're going to be next to um, or what artwork. You don't have a choice in that matter. Like, in your own collection, it will show up that way. But I think that's important to note. Um, I mean, now everything is proof of stake. Ethereum is proof of stake. So, um, you know, that's very more, much more energy efficient. But there are also, um, you know, companies like Verisart, which is doing, like, certificates of authenticity for physical arts. Okay, so digital identity. Thank you, guys. It's proof of who we are. <laughs> um, I think Web3 is really thinking about, you know, what if all these pieces of information of who we were, like from, again, using like the birth certificate to um, when you log in to pay like a utility bill online, if all of that was located in one place and easily accessible. So, you know, the technology exists, it's evolving, you know, each day. Um, and, you know, Web3 is thinking about new ways to kind of reimagine this, this next phase of digital identity. Um, I think beyond the social media aspect, right, of like this like digital persona we're putting out into the world. It's like, how can we really consolidate um, actual information about us and, and be able to have authority over who sees what? Um, so the secret recovery phase we touched on, but like, you know, it's like 12 random words, write them down in that order. And, uh, you know, if anyone gets this phrase, they can like steal, you know, all of your, your collection and stuff like that. So, you know, hacking, it's a very real thing. Um, I, so I have many different accounts and wallets. Um, that's actually maybe too many. Um, but you know, I'll use one for like buying crypto, like, and then I use another account for like, where I put like all my NFTs, where I transfer it to it. Um, and then you also have like a hard storage that you can then save it. So like I recommend, you know, doing all of that, right? So um, no one really has access to the account that's like holding your NFTs. Um, you know, you just immediately kind of transfer it to yourself. 
And then, yeah, this is the, you know, this many digit number. Um, I can't memorize mine. Maybe you guys can. That'd probably be a good thing. Um, but basically, you can take a number and um, search on Etherscan and um, see all the transactions of it. So let me see. Okay, it's working again. All right, guys. Let's just see what I've been doing. Let's just take my account number. So I can't name names, but it's really come to light that some people that say, you know, they've been collecting art, blah, blah, blah. And then you go on Etherscan and you see the artists haven't really gotten anything or they've all been gifted and donated. So you can really call it out. I mean, look, I still have trouble with Etherscan. It's like a bunch of numbers, like what does it mean? Um, but I've, I had um, a Women of the World NFT stolen from me and basically use that transaction hashtag to go into Etherscan to get the the public number of like where it was and went to OpenSea and found it and contacted OpenSea and they told me that I had like transferred it to a marketplace I had never even heard of. So I don't know even like what went wrong. I think like at, I think what happened was like MetaMask prompted me like incorrect password, like some sort of error. Yeah. And I was like an idiot, like, no, I want this now. Um, and so, uh, you know, MetaMask has been really good about releasing, like when there's bugs or things to watch out for. So definitely like always stay, I think, up to date with like, what are the, the new like hacking like scenarios that are going on. Um, but uh, yeah, I was able to use it to basically track down like who had actually had the NFT. Um, but Again, like this number, this is where like anonymity comes in. Um, you know, like I on OpenSea, I mean, I have an image of myself. It's probably dumb. Um, but, you know, a lot of people, they have like a PFP, like a profile, you know, picture um, in place. So the, you know, I couldn't like reach out to this person and see like, where is he located? Like, where was his VPN? Like, there was no way for me to get, you know, it back. Um, so self-custody, um, you know, obviously we all use banks, right, um, to keep our money in. Um, and they, they act as like kind of a guardian of our accounts. Um, with Web3, it's really allowing us to take responsibility and ownership of our own assets um, inside our digital wallet, which is why it's our responsibility to write down all the passwords and keep them in the safe and don't like email it to yourself, which is like what I did the first time. Um, and uh, yeah, it's like you have complete access and no one else does. And you know, what's gone wrong with, like how many times have you like been on vacation or in a different state and like your credit card gets declined or shut down because of fraud and then you have to like get on the phone with them. And you know, so that's like, you don't always have control of your money, right? Or like when you can get it out. Or if there's a financial crisis, you know, like in 2008, when the stock market crashed, people couldn't pull out, the, pull out their money. Um, or even more recently, like SVB, the Silicon Valley Bank, um, you know, people were started withdrawing money, then they like froze all the accounts. Like I know lots of VCs, other companies, startups that like did not have access to their money. They couldn't pay their employees. They couldn't make milestones. Um, so, you know, basically having a digital wallet, you have complete ownership of everything that's in it. Let's try a simulation of it for self custody. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is just explaining, like, I want to transfer funds. You can't because of COVID, you guys probably can't see this. Um, like, I don't know if that happened to me, like during COVID, like, okay, great. Um, I have $20 for the next two days. Um, you know, financial setbacks. Anyways, there's all different. <laughs> Everyone's having cake. Sorry. We're at lunch. No. Um, but again, like crypto exchange, it's always working, right? Like you can always transfer funds. And again, it's instantaneously. The key, you know, takeaways that I hope everyone got today um, is, you know, Web3 is the next generation of the internet. 
It includes cryptocurrencies, NFTs, and blockchaining technology, which is really, I think, fundamental. Um, and crypto wallets are, you know, digital wallets designed for Web3 to help you manage permissions, um, store your assets, and, you know, really control over who has access to what part of your data. And they have a unique phrase known as secret recovery phrase. Um, and if you lose it, you'll never get access again. Uh, and Web3 is a movement that grants us ownership over data, digital identity, and assets. I think you guys have a handout of important terms. We went over some of these today. Um, I think just what I want to point out is, you know, like the floor, floor price is like the lowest price for which an NFT can be purchased on a marketplace and then gas fees. So every time you make a transaction, uh, you're going to have a fee associated with it um, called a gas fee. Um, and it, totally varies on the time of day like you know like uber rides like you know sometimes they're more expensive because it's like raining or like concerts getting out um so you know if you think the price is too high just wait you know an hour and then see you know if it's at a lower rate um well thank you so much for your time um hope, hope it was helpful First of all, welcome to Ethos and Culture, understanding the values of Web3. Um, we're going to be exploring the principles and the beliefs at the heart of Web3 uh, technology and community, right? Because it's super important. Something I'm extremely passionate about, most importantly. Now listen, here's a story I have for you. On a seemingly typical Monday morning, something remarkable happened. A musician lost $14,000 of crypto due to a malware attack. We were just talking about, you know, losing your assets, right? That happens quite often for anyone who's involved. The community came together with incredible speed to help restore his losses, okay? Going above their donations, even going double what he had lost before. Now, this inspiring event, I will say, is really at the essence of how powerful Web3 is beyond its technical advancements, okay? Um, it really stands for trust, collaboration, and generosity. And that's something I believe entirely with my whole being. Now, especially as we create, you know, a more inclusive uh, economic system that should be more transparent and equitable. So we want, you know, obviously trust to be flowing. Now, in this lecture, I'm going to be, uh, you know, bringing you through the culture uh, and behind and, and really bringing you behind the scenes of the values of what is a part of this emerging technology. Because sure, there's a lot of tech involved. We want to make wallets, we want to do this, but we really want to live and, and, and act as if we're creating a whole new economy, a whole new system that's built on goodness. So question for many of you, uh, and I'm sure you have at this point because you're here, but uh, have you heard of Web3 before you came to this event today? You got a no back there. Love to see it. Amazing. Um, now, before we get into it, um, you're probably wondering, like, who's this girl? What, why does she matter? Why is she talking to me at all? Well, my name is Elise Swopes. I am a self-taught graphic designer and photographer among many other things, um, but I have been able to utilize my Instagram platform for good. Bringing it back a little bit, over a decade uh, ago, I, I signed up for Instagram and I was a college dropout. I had nothing to my name but a broken iPhone 4 and I signed up for Instagram and started creating these different uh, surreal kind of photography uh, elements that you see kind of on the side here. We've got a sunrise here, we've got uh, a drop that I did on Nifty Gateway and another drop I did on Nifty. Um, you know, a lot of my artwork will bring you on a creative, surrealistic journey. Um, I love to shoot in urban landscapes, but most importantly, why I have the ability to kind of talk about NFTs is because I sold over 200,000 in 2021, and I've since sold multiple collections on Nifty Gateway that sold out in minutes, which is always exciting. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and of course, every single collection that I've done has had a meaning to it. Um, and you'll see these giraffes right here. This is my piece called Giraffes in Chicago. 
Drafts in Chicago was a partnership that I did with a, a Kenyan um, draft conservationist, and they gave me photos that they had shot of drafts that they take care of, and I edited those in scenes um, that I basically traveled to in five short days. I went to five different cities in five days, one day in a different city. It sounds exciting, but it was horrific because <laughs> the whole point of it was really educating people about draft displacement because that's the biggest issue with drafts right now is that people are coming to their water holes because people can't live in certain areas. And so I wanted just to displace myself consistently in different places to help educate people about how difficult that was. So I created a video of myself, um, you know, doing the whole process. And so people can kind of see the behind the scenes of, of that. But um, so far, I'm the founder of Sunrise Art Club, which is a Web3 impact agency that supports education um, and different events and different curations and um, just intentional project building on different solutions that we want to create within Web3. So we created the first marketplace for incarcerated artists, which is always um, really exciting to talk about. Um, but I also have an editing app called Urban Jungle Photo Editing. Check that out. Um, but it's got cool little giraffe uh, elements and stuff in there that you can play with. But I also earned life credit at Columbia College Chicago in the last year. It means I graduated college last year after being 13 years of dropout. <laughs> clap it up, clap it up. <laughs> so we have a lot of under our belts. I've done a lot of stuff, worked with tons of different brands, worked with a lot of celebrities um, and have the NFT background, but didn't get an NFTs until late 2020. We got in uh, to Super Rare in 2021 and, you know, got very blessed with putting in that work over times. But let's get into it because this is what I like talking about. I like talking about why we're here, why we're in Web3. Um, and you touched on it a little bit. I loved it. Great intro to how we're going to dig a little deeper into the human aspect of it. Of course. <laughs> I am. I'm glad because you were talking about a little things. I was like, I hope she didn't say what I need to say. <laughs> um, yeah, but you know, the early 2000s saw like a revolutionary change to the internet. You know, seems like we may have all been there. Um, and the transition from Web 1.0 to Web 2.0, or it's commonly known as the social web. Um, you know, with its rise came a lot more powerful digital devices and platforms that allowed us as users to communicate, to consume, um, to uh, shop online, most importantly, obviously with the rise of Amazon and all these wonderful things that we are addicted to at this point. Um, and huge tech companies, of course, right? Like Google, Facebook, uh, Amazon, as I've just touched on, they genuinely provide a wealth of services to people. You know, at the beginning, it seemed like we were getting all our problems solved, but now it's almost like they've created bigger problems out of the solutions. Um, so the issue with that is that we're getting services on their terms, right? Um, and they're actually paving the way for an entirely uh, new, you know, way to interact with the web, which was fantastic. I was really happy about that. Thank you. But we'll talk a little bit more about why we're not as grateful at this point. Now, Web3 is revolutionizing the internet, as we all know. That's really the reason why we're here. We're excited to, to kind of dive deep and be open-minded about what's next. And it's ushering an era of fairness and equality, my favorite words. Um, it decentralizes power away from one person or group so that every single one of us has a voice. Now, with enhanced data protection measures, people can safeguard their identity more securely than ever before. That's why we're talking about all these wonderful, you know, digits and different things. It makes it so much harder for people to actually know that that is who we are when we're represented in an internet space. And again, making it impossible for someone to steal your information without permission. So, you know, we touched a little bit about why we need to write it down. The reason why we need to write it down and keep it physical is because anyone can hack into our computer at the click of something. And so when someone can, you know, quick 
Control F right into your computer and search, you know, a seed phrase, and you've got a, a, a Word doc, you know, ready to go. And now they're like, all right, I got it. They will easily pull that in and, you know, place it in there. Whereas if you got hacked and someone's trying to log in your wallet and they can't find your seed phrase on your computer, oh well. It's not there. So now you may get hacked on other things, but not that. <laughs> so by connecting different seam, uh, systems seamlessly with you know, open communication protocols, um, sharing info across platforms really is no longer re requires you know, us jumping through these crazy hoops. So it really makes um, the digital world a better place you know, for all of us, giving humanity absolute control over our online interactions. Who would have thought? <laughs> Um, now, I like to use this analogy that Web3 is like a giant library. Everyone controls the books that they check out and, uh, you know, they can use them however they want. Um, and the books are stored on many connected computers. So that makes it pretty much morally impossible um, to get lost or damaged. So it's also managed by many people instead of just one person who's in charge. There's not one librarian at the desk. There's tons of people making it more democratic and fair. And so to be able to use these books, you need a unique key. It's the key we're talking about. This key is like your digital passport. It's got all your, your, your stamps on it. You, it's telling everybody what books you have, okay? It also lets people share those books with other people in the community. So you can kind of pass books, you know, for a passport. So that's always like my, my most simple way of, of digesting Web3 to individuals, or at least, you know, what is a wallet? What are we doing here? What is, what is the, the basis of, of what we're trying to accomplish? Now, the guiding principles, you touched on them too. I was like, don't get too carried away. Hold back, hold back. <laughs> you know, the guiding principles, again, is decentralization. You know, it, it's, it's the fact that no person or group controls the network or its information, which is really important. Um, because you think about these perfect examples. We've got Facebook, love Facebook to an extent, never log in, but that's okay. <laughs> you know, with Web3, users can take back control of their data, uh, you know, from big tech com companies like Facebook. And so we can absolutely use our data for financial gain versus them using it. It's just about us figuring out how we would use it the same way they figure it out. Um, this revolutionary you know, type of development and how we react or, or interact with social media you know, really represents, at the end of the day, a shift from those centralized platforms. And I'll even say, you know, we talk a lot about OpenSea and all the, you know, super rare. And we had a call the other day talking about it. <laughs> this guy right here, I'm really glad he's here. Um, we had a really great call. He's like, I really want to be on Super Rare. I really want to be Super Rare. But like, Super Rare is still almost centralized in a way. And I feel like we, and I was someone's like, make your own contract, put it on your own website. Because at the end of the day, that's really what it's about is getting away from the people who control the way that we perceive, the way they control how we're, you know, even presented to the masses. So, you know, it's, it really assists us without needing for people to decide, you know, for us. So Google is another really great example. Um, you know, with Web3, users are able to uh, access search engine experiences that actually respects their privacy, okay? Um, free from the watchful gazes of companies like Google who can track and monetize your every search, okay? So you can sometimes forget about, you know, being spammed with targeted ads. That'd be nice. Maybe? I don't know. Sometimes I'm kind of thankful for them because I'm like, damn, I kind of needed that. Um, <laughs> but it's the fact that you can have control over what those things are because those people are gaining actual money from the way that you search and the way that you are inter, you know, ingrained within the internet, which is kind of interesting. Um, so it, it really offers your opportunity to just have more peace when you know, engaging with the internet. It makes it your decision. Uh, and that's why we've seen the things, you know, the cookies things and all that kind of stuff, which is great. Love cookies um, and the fact that they get to ask us now, we get to accept all. Sometimes I'm like, stop asking me. I'll just hit accept all because I'm like, just take it. <laughs> just take it. Um, but I need to like sit and be like, no, don't, don't do that. But um, even thinking about Uber, 
right? Uber has revolutionized how we get around. Um, but at the end of the day, if it was decentralized, we would probably be able to choose the price that we wanted to pay, and the actual drivers would be able to accept that price and take the full 100% amount. So the issue is, is that they're commissioning fees, right? There's like Uber takes a cut and then pays the, the, the driver. Um, and we have to cons consistently decide or at least accept that Uber has chosen that price for us or at least trust that they know that everything's clogged up. We don't know that, but it could be. <laughs> We're probably walking around outside the, you know, I don't know, like the football game or something I've been at and I'm like, I can't find an Uber and it, that makes sense to me. But again, there's no middleman taking their cut. Riders can save money while drivers earn what they deserve. Um, and gives everybody an extra reason to hail a ride, right? And so getting into the behemoth that is Amazon, um, Amazon obviously is the titan of online retail, right, of course, um, but a decentralized Web3 marketplace could truly revolutionize the industrial space, um, offering new levels of competition, first of all, because there is a huge, I'm telling you, it sounds great that everybody can sell stuff online, but it's horrible for the environment and it's not sustainable. So if we limit the way that people have competition, new levels of competition and entry and limited entry, it allows less environmental disasters from factories and invites tons of less shipping and putting exhaust into the air. Um, so again, this would just reduce so much of the things that we're consistently concerned about. I've just talked a lot about the decentralization, right? But now let's get into transparency. Now, you said it perfectly. Um, again, everyone can see and check the information about transactions. It is public for everyone to see. That is basically what transparency is, but that is the guiding principle to what Web3 is. Also, user empowerment um, gives users control over their own data and digital identity, right? So when you feel like you have control, you want to take control. It's easy as that. Now, talking about peer-to-peer. -peer. Now, this one is talked about quite a bit, but it needs to make a little bit more sense um, to people who really don't need it. Um, you know, I'm not at an interconnected computer consistently mining or trying to, uh, you know, do exchanges, but I think that this system at the end of the day is like a hive, okay? It's interconnected um, and it's got, uh, with its specialties, it's got its expertise, it's got different things that it really uh, makes sure that it accomplishes. But working together in harmony, they can share resources, files, services, everything that an organization would need to succeed. So at the end of the day, that's what peer-to-peer -peer means, even not just in the digital space, but in the business space, to the artist space. We're consistently doing peer-to-peer -peer, um, experiences, but you know, people hear these larger attachments to them within crypto, and so we kind of get lost. But um, you know, it is a, a fairly human experience. Um, and one last word I didn't add on here, but I'll probably touch on it at, at some point, is inoperability. Um, inoperability is the ability of different networks to communicate and interact with each other seamlessly, um, which is really important, obviously, with our need to trust each other and implement different transactions with the trust of some minor. And we talk about minor, too. It's not like a minor child. This is a minor, <laughs> this is a minor who, in the grand scheme, is like maybe in a mine, and then they're like mining and they're getting the gold. They're basically you know, someone who is telling you how much something will be if they, um, you know, create that transaction for you. Um, so, again, at the end of the day, Web3 is about creating a more democratic, uh, equitable, and collaborative internet. Now, principles in action, lighting the way. What are these principles actually providing for us? Um, now, tokenization slash minting is the process of converting assets into digital tokens, simply put, okay? Um, and adding it into the blockchain. And this allows assets to be represented as digital tokens that are owned, stored, and transferred using blockchain technology. Um, now, creators can now turn their ideas and inventions into real profits with tokenization. 
And, and some examples are, you know, they can enable fans to purchase tokens representing ownership and investment in, an, you know, an artist they're fans of. Um, and even in their content. I have a friend who just created a project where um, the music artist has people who can create content for him, you know, reels and Instagrams or posts or whatever they want to create. And the more that they put that out there, the more views they get, the more they get paid. And that allows the artist to get paid in the long run, but it also allows a trickle down effect for you to get paid by supporting someone with their vision, right? Um, so creators can really monetize their work while further strengthening relationships with them and the people that support them the most, right? It's, it's pretty crucial. I wish they would have done that when Britney Spears first started. I would have been wealthy. Or maybe I'm mean broke right now. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so decentralized marketplaces, um, you know, they make it easier for creators to gain freedom from central authorities that often limit their ability to profit. You know, we're bypassing high fees um, and rigid rules and um, really opening up much more opportunity for entrepreneurs to uh, take advancement into today's world. Now, we talked a little bit about how, you know, we've got these different levels of platforms. Um, but as example, obviously, the decentralized marketplaces like OpenSea and Rarible, um, Super Rare, and even Uniswap. Um, many of you may have used Uniswap, but maybe you will at some point. Uniswap is sometimes implemented within MetaMask or in Gnosis wallets or different things where you can exchange certain coins for other coins um, at a reasonable rate. So it allows you to kind of cross uh, different chains, so to speak. Um, and so that is also a really helpful way um, and a useful way for decentralized marketplaces where we don't necessarily need to go on Coinbase, for example, or I don't know, an exchange that probably costs or does a lot more and takes a lot longer specifically. Sometimes you go on an exchange, it takes two to three days to get your, 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 your Bitcoin or your ETH. That's, that's not decentralized to me. <laughs> um, and that's why those crumbled, by the way, but that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and yeah. Um, <laughs> so with royalties, you touched on a little bit, love it, because that's a huge thing. It's a whole situation. With royalties, creatives can now receive steady income, okay? That's important, but to an extent, um, and that's from selling or distributing their content and their services. And using Web3 technology to automate royalty payments, um, you know, provides creators with safe, um, reliable transactions that are being able to, that are able to be tracked. So I think one of the most important things for me is imagining um, the fact that you know you can't always trust as an artist or a creative in general that a business or an agency or a brand is actually taking care of you. The fact that I could look on a contract, that I can check out a certain thing or check out a certain wallet and know that something's happened to my artwork and have proof of that is a huge thing. Um, because sometimes I'm tired of emailing somebody for my, my net 60 and I'm like, I'm tired. Um, but that to me is like, if I could check the agency's transactions on their ether scan, right? I'd be like, oh, I see you guys got the payment. Why are you taking this long? <laughs> right? So eliminating any guesswork. Okay. That's like the biggest thing is we're tired of like guessing, wondering when, when is someone going to give us our answer? We have the answer right now. Now, it's interesting, it's like a huge pressing issue, royalties, you wouldn't expect it to be because at the end of the day, when I think about Web3, royalties are like what it's about. Like I thought this was like what we were supposed to do because you're in these you know, big uh, establishments and they've got paper, they've got emails, they've got their Excel sheets or whatever, but it's not enough. That means there's a person on the other end to have to consistently keep up and track and you know, do the work. When as we have this coding now, that allows NFT artists to track what happens. And any artist, we put NFT at the beginning because we're talking about NFTs, but this is just an artist experience at the end of the day. So they're always you know, questioning artist royalties. Um, and it's been a whole, a whole conversation recently. At the end of the day, the controversy really 
sparked like a bigger discussion about like what we're really doing in the space um, and you know what industry standards are important to ensure that like every artist feels safe in any space. The fact that there are collectors questioning that is also questionable, um, but to each his own, to each his own. And then DAOs, talk a little bit about that too. DAOs are the new breed of businesses that are revolutionizing the way people connect and collaborate. Um, they're also called decentralized autonomous organizations. Um, decentralized, obviously, because a key word, nobody owns it, it's, one, it's a group of people. Autonomous, meaning there is um, somewhat of a, uh, a system in place where you know, you know, Web3 is implemented uh, within whether that's the transaction, whether that's the wallets that they all share, whether that's the Gnosis safe that everybody's consistently um, involved with. There's a lot of automatic, systematic things that are happening because they're on the blockchain and in the coding. So um, at the end of the day, Noah's in charge of these communities, which is nice. Sometimes it feels like there may be, but you know, everyone can kind of come up and perform as they please and present um, different ideas. But at the end of the day, it has to be voted on by the collective. It can't just be one person saying, you know, I think this is good for the group. It doesn't work that way. It's still very democratic um, and important to have, you know, these different forward thinking things that are created because at the end of the day, um, a lot of these transition, like traditional models are really not empowering individuals. So we just have to make sure that we are able to reach agreements in a way that feels trustworthy, that's transparent, and that makes sense to each one of us. So meta labels, for example, is like one of the new kind of things that came up. Um, it's kind of similar to DAOs, but not really. My developer, uh, Lauren Dorman, is actually a part of meta labels. And uh, meta labels actually allow users like worldwide um, to come together as peers for just common goals. So you can just be a part of it and just add into it and make it happen. And you guys just make money together. It's just how it is. Sounds nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so question real quick. How many of you feel optimistic about the potential of the Web3 future? Raise your hand. Ooh, everybody, yes, <laughs> yes. Yes, I love this. Again, Web3, you know, has the technology um, to potentially revolutionize so many different things from financial services um, to uh, even individuals, obviously, who don't have uh, banking, you know, traditional banking. It really gives them an opportunity to send money across borders, to obtain small loans that they've never been able to do. Um, but make sure that you're not taking out loans for NFTs. Please do not do that. I've just seen a couple people like, Franklin, he's gone. I don't know where Franklin went. Franklin left. Somebody just deactivated you guys. It's been crazy. Web3 is wild every day, I'm telling you. Um, but you know, you, you, it, this again, it gives everybody an opportunity to kind of get money to invest in their ideas. And with community-based decision-making, um, people can take collective action, as I said, you know, to affect change in their local democracies, which is huge because as we've seen, there's been a lot of talk about the different instances of you know, Cambridge Analytica. And we've got all these different things happening when it comes to um, voting and, you know, like, I don't even know why we're not voting digitally already. I think it's coming, but they got to use Web3. Um, but, you know, there's so many different things that, uh, that we take issue to that would, that would really um, be assisted with Web3 for sure. And the resources and, and uh, decisions, again, would not be determined by one person. So you think about if there was a catastrophe in one area, right? That would, mean, that would mean that the people in the area get to vote and choose what help they receive from the government. It's not just one mayor or one person or one president who gets to decide. It's everyone gets to vote and say, we need this because we're here and we're experiencing this. And again, that helps shape a better future for them and ourselves. Because when people are good everywhere else, everybody else is good. And Web3 offers hope in a world grappling with climate change, ep economic inequality, and tech security issues. You know, I had a friend, I'll just tell a quick story. I had a friend, she's a therapist. Um, and in 2021, like everybody's talking about NFTs on Twitter, everybody. 
And she uh, was like, I'm blocking the word NFTs. I never want to see it. And I'm like, girl, let's get on a call real quick because I need to talk to you. Now, the process was, for me, was understanding what the issues were for her as a therapist, right? The issue was that she couldn't access her, um, you know, the people who came to see her couldn't, couldn't access their past information, you know? Um, that she knew that sometimes they would have their credit cards stolen when they would go in to see her and different platforms that they would use or they would lose it. I don't know, there'd be different things um, with their credit cards or information being, being, being hacked. Um, and dependent on what platform she'd use, you know? And then um, some other things. And so really what I think was important was meeting her where she was at to figure out what problems are there in your field and what things can we solve with Web3. So I basically told her, you know, if people had a wallet, they wouldn't get their information hacked, you know? And then we'd be able to have a decentralized way of privacy with people's medical information. You have a new doctor, you don't need to transfer it from that other doctor or tell them you need to send it. They've already got access in their decentralized database because every centralized database that a doctor uses is a platform that's owned by a private entity that's making money off your information and your health. So the less that doctors and people have to pay for these platforms and put their trust in these platforms to, to allow them to implement all these different things, the less trust that each of us as individuals have trust in the healthcare system and in our therapists, because they don't know us, they haven't studied us, because they can't. Anyway, I sold her. <laughs> she did not block NFTs. Um, so again, giving people um, limited power access to safe online po um, uh, empowers them to strive for progress and justice. So um, I think it's very important that people are not distracted by all the different things that are consistently thrown at them on these different platforms, like Facebook, Google. Um, OK, so. The culture of Web3. Love the culture of Web3. Talked about it a little bit already, but I'm just going to keep ingraining it so that when you get a part of it, you live it. We want to live this life. We want to be a part. We want to. We want to really um, create a new system that, um, you know, is a, is a powerful tool that can unite people from different places all over the world, um, allowing them to understand each other better. I mean, it's, I don't know about you, but it seems like people are more separated than ever. And it would be great if we could, you know, foster an inclusive environment um, where everyone's voice matters, where every single po person's voice matters, um, where we create relationships built on mutual respect for each other, um, which ultimately leads to stronger systems that really benefits us all, okay? It's really that simple. But uh, accountability and trust, it really lies at like the heart of Web3. It really does. It, 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 is, it is the heart of the successful Web3 systems because um, you know, interacting within a culture that values these concepts really ensures that everyone can rely on each other. Um, and that creates an environment where participants know they're in safe hands. Sometimes <laughs> I, oh, the way that Web3 is going, and I'm giving you my like dream Web3 right now. I'm just telling you, like, I'm just like, this is like the culture I'm enabling and educating people on because I think this is what it's built on. But sometimes in Web3, I don't feel like I'm in the safest hands because there is no ability to express ourselves without being or feeling like, you know, we're gonna be blacklisted or whatever or something like that. So it's really important that we create an environment where everyone feels they're accountable for their actions, but they're also being able to trust other people with being open and honest about the issues that they um, see within the space. And again, we can, we can empower those um, with less influence, less privilege, um, to access new opportunities to work towards a more equitable world. Um, and again, culture and ethos will play an integral, integral role in guiding um, how this powerful tool is, tool is used. Um, for the betterment of all, and not just some people. We've seen the same people winning over and over again. I'm kind of tired of it. And um, so as an example, uh, consider like the emergence of crypto philanthropy. There's a ton of it out there, um, which highlights the potential impact of community-driven ethos in the use of Web3 technology. Um, in late 2021, uh, the crypto exchange BitGive launched a platform um, called GiveTrack 
2.0, okay? Um, which uses blockchain technology to track donations and enhance transparency in charity giving. So imagine when you are, you know, a lot of people talk about this, and I do especially, who are like, donate to Red Cross, donate to Red Cross. I need to see receipts, okay? And I'm just being honest. <laughs> we need to see receipts. And so I love, um, you know, platforms like this where we're now elevating the accountability and that trust, where we really want to make sure that when we give our money to somewhere, that it's going to that somewhere. Um, and this really assists everybody in feeling like they can be more impactful within a wider community. Um, and again, it, you know, it's, it's, it does disaster relief efforts, social services, um, environmental charities, tons of different things, which is really nice. So we've got that brewing among many other uh, philanthropic uh, platforms. The power of togetherness. Oh, I love it. it. Makes me feel good. Um, you know, by pooling together different perspectives and skills, we can truly unlock unlimited amounts of creativity. I'm telling you, that's what this is all about. It's really what it's all about. Um, it's funny because when I first started in Web3, I followed like 2,000 people like in the first like couple months. I regret it now. It's horrible. But it was like, at first I was really excited because I was like, there are so many people all over the world that's making art. Oh my God. I'm like, this is amazing. I know everyone. My first reaction was like, I'm surprised people aren't fighting more like every day. Like not like, but like just having more disagreements because cultures are so different. You know, we're all so different in the way we behave, the way we see things, the way we make things, the way we eat and breathe and sleep, like all that different stuff, um, and even treat creativity. And so I think it's amazing in a decentralized network where we can um, welcome uh, the idea that everyone can contribute their ideas, right? Um, and that means the possibility for growth consistently. We know that for a fact. Um, and again, that'll assist more people with increased adoption. Um, and the more we, you know, from the outside that, that people see that that's evolving and the togetherness is true, the more people will, will feel like they wanna be a part of it. Um, and that's why I think it's just really, really crucial that we uh, be about this life. Because when the community leads with development, amazing things happen. It's really simple. Uh, building something together builds an emotional connection and a sense of ownership, truly. So when you're a part of something, imagine you know, you're know you at the ground up adding some ability to, I don't know, creating Amazon. This is a different Amazon, but we're creating Amazon together. <laughs> and when you know you've created and added your time to it, you build this emotional connection and sense of ownership with the people that you've involved yourself with. And people not only feel invested, in the creation of it, but they're also proud to promote it and celebrate its success because they know that it came from the ground up and they were involved with every piece. One example, I think, of interesting working together um, is Gitcoin. If anybody's heard of Gitcoin, G-I-T-C-O-I-N. Um, it's a website that helps people work together on open source projects, which is really, really cool. It rewards people for their contributions uh, with a special form of payment called quadratic funding. Quadratic funding. Um, this means the more people that join in, the more the money or the more money the project will get, which is interesting. It's like kind of wanted to do that, but you kind of don't, but you do. Um, so <laughs> let's say you're a developer who wants to contribute to an open open source project, right? You just find it. You're like, I can I can do this. Let's go. I'm I'm, I'm inspired. You can visit Gitcoin. Uh, browse through the different projects listed on the platform. And once you find a project that interests you, like I said, you can choose to work on a particular issue or feature that project and submit your work through Gitcoin's project, uh, platform. So it incentivizes collaboration and contribution, but it also allows you to earn when you work without asking anybody for permission. These rewards are funded by sponsors, which is really cool. Um, and they just want to support great projects and want to see good tools happen, right? I mean, people encourage development in this space, which is the most important thing. 
And once you submit your work, it goes through a process um, to ensure that it's actually quality. You can't just be like, oh, I'm going to do this and then do it and they pay you. No, they got to make sure it works. Um, and it just aligns with the project goals. So again, you know, you just have this amazing opportunity to not email people and be like, hey, can I help you with this project? Just be like, I'm helping. Let's go. And if your work is accepted, you receive um, a reward. Um, and then you can withdraw that reward or you can just invest it in other projects. So, you know, it's this amazing little economy, a little cycle of creation and um, evolution. And this, you know, fosters community driven approach to open source development and encourages collaboration across borders and time zones. So this is for anybody all around the world who wants to be involved. Now, another question. How many of you believe that Web3 can contribute a more equitable distribution of wealth and resources? Okay, we see some doubters over there. I know, I know. I'd like to think so too. I know, okay. See, the hope is alive up here, but let's go, let's test it out. The importance of sovereignty, okay? Now, human sovereignty is the essential tool to safeguard our individual freedom, right? In a world that seems increasingly dominated by powerful entities, it allows us as individuals and communities to chart our own paths, exercising our power over decisions we make for ourselves, voicing opinions without the interference of external sources, um, which at the end of the day helps us get to our goals unhindered. Now, without it, there would be a great risk of sacrificing not only our freedom, but also our individuality. I see, I like your dress over there. You know what I'm saying? Like, you dressed up. Imagine if someone was like, you can't dress like that. <laughs> I'd be sad. I don't know. You can't? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> see? I don't know. So we can't go back to that, right? So becoming mere pieces of, on someone else's chessboard instead of the masters of our own destiny is, is what's kind of happening if we kept the Web2 kind of environment going. Now, as artists, we have tremendous power to liberate and inspire. It seems like a lot of pressure, but as long as we look around us and express what we're feeling, I think we can do it. Um, our creativity can be used as a tool to amplify self-expression and rejecting the constraints that seem to diminish our freedom. Through art, we are able to create atmosphere of possibility where people feel inspired enough to change their lives in favor of freedom and individualism. So imagine if everyone like, like felt that they had the power. That power is what we need everybody to feel because it will allow our ability to inspire change and to build reliant new systems that actually serve humanity, that really truly do. And through this creative expression, we can genuinely disrupt all the traditional, traditional economic models that we have seen consistently. I'm tired of them, I don't know about you, and because they profit off of me. They profit off of all of us consistently. And we need alternative solutions that are focused on equality and sustainability. 2018, you know, people found out that Cambridge Analytica had take personal data from millions of Facebook users. It's a fact, they did it without letting them know. They used this data to try to change the results of the election, which is pretty crazy. I don't know what they were trying to accomplish. It didn't work on me. Um, <laughs> People were worried about their privacy and safety, as they should be, everyone, not even just people who, you know, wanted Trump out or in. It's like everyone was like, I don't know about that. I don't want anybody deciding my choices. Um, and this is why, again, some people are really interested in the fact that they want to create Web3. They're just tired of Facebook. We want something different. We want something new. And maybe at the cost of people not understanding what's really going on, but that's okay, because we're going to teach them little by little. Innovation and experimentation um, are the keys to unlocking our possibilities to progress. It is crucial, it is absolutely crucial. With the decentralized and open approach to technology, obviously, as I've said, Web3 is fostering community of people who are just unafraid to take risks. A lot of people are, are taking risks because it's not gonna 
cost them a lot, as it used to be. Now, creativity is not only encouraged, but celebrated, absolutely celebrated in this space. And that, again, provides an environment where revolutionary solutions can be developed and daring new concepts can be pursued without restriction. Um, and then again, that opens the possibilities that just are remaining locked for right now. Now, developers can make these particular kind of apps called DApps or DApps, depending on how you feel. De <laughs> what do you guys say? You say DApps? You say DApps? DApps. <laughs> um, DApps? DApps. DApps are a key to a concept to Web3 technology, okay? They're decentralized applications. And why are DApps so important? Now, unlike traditional apps, DApps run on a decentralized network, which is amazing. Pretty clear there, usually a blockchain, and allows for that peer-to-peer -peer interaction. We talk about that word peer-to-peer -peer here. And eliminates the need for the middleman. I'm looking right at you, Apple. I know you got a store somewhere in here somewhere. <laughs> Um, but <laughs> they are the middleman to the app market, you guys, and, and they are dominating the app sphere. Um, and I, you know, I have an app myself, and so I know that they take 30% of every single sale we make. That means that I, if I want to be on anybody's phone, I got to be in the app store, right? I mean, they, they just dominate the space, but with these types of dApps, we're able to eliminate that, which means that every single sale, every single experience, everything is to who it should be towards. Now, designed to be open source, so that means that the, co the code source to any dApp um, is freely available to the public, um, and that allows you know, people and developers to collaborate and evolve the dApp, make it better. Um, and these apps can be used for money, uh, for games, or talking with friends. Uh, and Web3 is also paving the way for new use cases um, such as decentralized finance and NFTs. We talked a little bit about DeFi, right? But DeFi stands for decentralized finance. Um, and it is a set of financial products uh, like lending, borrowing, um, and even um, trading, of course. So, and then NFTs, you know, we all know at this point um, are digital items that are special and different from things like crypto. People sometimes confuse, they think it's cryptocurrency, but it's usually not. Um, and they can represent artwork and music and game items, virtual uh, things, but we'll get more into that in a bit. I wanna talk about FWB as an example, as a fun example of a Web3 social club because um, it leverages blockchain technology uh, to create some really interesting, uh, use cases for like an, an exclusive social club. Um, now I bought the tokens, they didn't accept me yet. That's okay, we'll figure that out. But the club, the, excuse me, the club uses a, it's been a while, I'm like, what are you, I'm like, I was about to sell the coins, so I'm like, what are we doing here? Anyway, but um, that's a personal issue. So the club uses a uh, DAO, and we talked a little bit about DAO, decentralized autonomous organization to give members a say and how the club is run and to vote on various proposals. Okay, so members can also earn social tokens uh, that can be used to access exclusive events. They have pop-in events, um, experiences, and merchandise. So they have a great uh, cohort of just individuals who are just talented, cultural, dope, that just come together and make cool stuff. Um, for an example, you know, a member of FWB uh, might attend a private concert featuring a, a popular artist that only members can attend, and that has happened many times. You'll see the line out the door, and someone will come up to the door, and they'll be like, why can't I get in? It's like, well, you don't have the coin. Um, so it's really, at the end of the day, that's called token gating, um, making sure that someone can own something to uh, allow themselves into what you've created. Again, this you know, creates a sense of community um, and exclusivity uh, versus like the social clubs that we're somewhat used to. Um, and uh, it's governed by its own members, which means there's no central authority uh, that can kind of dictate how it's run and who can be a member. So it's really cool. I've seen it from the outside and it's been <laughs> successful. <laughs> um, so, yeah, please. Yes. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. They're not a DAO. They're not a DAO. So they're speaking, it, I, it's similar to what you They are, I feel like they're a community. It's, like a it's just a community. It's just like a few of them. I don't know who's dictating because I don't have an ape and I don't know what they do. I don't know, I don't know exactly what they do. But I imagine that like Gordo or those people, you know, the, like the, the they, they have a little bit more say or the agency that owns them. They're all, to me, Bored Apes are giving Web 2 and they're teetering Web 3 just because of the assets they use. But they are they have a system and a rule and a regulation in place so that one, they don't have to pay huge taxes, probably, or they, they, they're not going to get sued by anybody or certain things. So that's why sometimes DAOs and these different meta labels we talk about a lot are potentially having a lot of issues because they are not utilizing the Web2 formats to protect themselves from the regulations that the state may have or the government may have or that an individual may have um, you know, within the, the, the uh, community. Because also on my site for Sunrise, for our agency, because we sometimes operate as a DAO, sometimes not, it depends on the project, but we have on our thing that we are able to deny malicious Things. Because if a group of people are like, oh, we're all going to buy a sunrise and then we're going to vote to like, I don't know, destroy this thing, like that's possible, right? But like, it's not possible because we're also like, okay, no. So <laughs> it's a possibility to kind of, you know. Um, but to me, I think, yeah, I think they're teetering web 2.5. Yeah. <laughs> but I do feel like it's, it's cool though because with me, in my mind, the cool part about their 3.0 is that everyone has a license to their ape. So they can create like the board ape waters, they can have the board ape burger, you know, pop up thing or whatever. They can use the, the, the branding or, or the, even the, mm -hmm. yeah, they can use it to their advantage, which is great for a lot of people. They what? <laughs> I thought that was doodles. Is that? So what are they doing? What's the ape waters are doing? <laughs> right, of course. Absolutely. I can't believe it. Web two, Web two point oh, as I said. Um, because what? Like that was the whole, that was like the coolest thing to me. That was the coolest thing. I was like, that's awesome. Pull the rug in many ways. Ooh. Here we go. All right, that's a word we use in Web three. Rugging. When a project is uh, canceled or just disappears, and they take all your money. That's what a rug is. Anyway, wow, I'm shook by that. Because again, I don't keep up with board apes. I'm like, kind of yeah. like, because one of my friends, Seneca, she's the designer, she's a woman who created all the board apes. And so I just was not a fan of them because they never credited her enough. And so I was always team Seneca and not team board apes. And so I always like distance myself from learning about anything, what they're doing. But I know that they're, now, now I'm not gonna say that anymore. <laughs> Everything's changed. So since we have a little bit of time left, I'll just show you this. As we said, we went over NFTs. This is all the things NFTs can be. Artwork, music, videos, photos, virtual real estate, in-game items, domain names, collectibles, event tickets, 3D models, memes, literary creations, fashion items, memberships like FWB. Um, you know, they become the go-to for securing ownership of blockchain technology. They're the most... Um, easy to onboard to, they're the most pretty, they're the most interesting. Shout out to creators, because I don't know what would happen without us in the last couple of years. It's cool because, um, and I could talk about this for a long time, so I'm just gonna skip to my good part of showing you my virtual real estate and talking about it. Um, now, people can, yes, one of the, one of my favorite industries that's really seen an economic boom um, is the virtual real estate. And that's just because I own some and I love my little gallery. 
um, not just gamers can purchase, but anybody really can uh, purchase and sell virtual lands like on Decentraland or Voxels. There's other things that are, that are being built. Um, but again, these virtual properties can be developed and customized uh, as the owners see fit. And as a result, like these, these properties sometimes can hold as much value as physical properties um, in the real world. But unlike physical ones, um, owning these certain things uh, does not require a large amount of capital usually, unless you're going like second secondary sales. But when they drop, very, very um, affordable. And this means, you know, the culture and revisiting back to the culture and ethos is that this means that people who may not have the means to invest in those physical uh, real estates can still participate in a digital marketplace and potentially generate income um, in the way they see fit. And it also provides opportunities for creative expression and innovation. So I'm going to show you real quick Swope's gallery. It's my little gallery. It's in voxels. It's the prettiest gallery you're going to see in voxels, I'll tell you that much. I designed it from top to bottom. I wrote out like a whole thing for this designer to do. Um, and he was like, I've never had anyone go this crazy on this, but I'm like, yes, I need to. So the bottom floor is my digital gallery where we do curations. We're just showing our NFT NYC curation on the bottom floor of all the artists that we showed in our in real life uh, exhibit as well. And then the second floor is all um, wellness quotes that I wrote. Um, it's kind of just like a grounding. When you're on the internet, you want to reset. Uh, it's a very mental wellness kind of approach. And then the third floor is education, where you learn about NFTs. You get an interview with the uh, project that I did about the giraffes and the um, and the the uh, rescue uh, team there, which is really cool. So just inviting them in and educating people as well about Web3 through that charitable process. Um, but you can visit that, oh wait, you can visit that on Swopes, Swopes.gallery, by the way, if you want to check it out. But go on a computer, do not go on your phone. It's, oof, it's crazy real quick. <laughs> um, so I had a few more examples here, but you guys know, you heard of NBA, NBA Top, Shop, Top Shots? Look that up too, pretty interesting use case uh, for NFTs, huge, huge, huge. Uh, for a while, but a lot of stuff. I could talk to you guys for a long time. I'm just going to say that. Um, now, one last question, you guys. Raise your hand if it's time for a Web3 revolution. Yeah. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Yeah, I see. Oh, I see the team hand up. Yes, everyone's paying attention. Um, now, as Web3 technologies become more prevalent, we have a special opportunity to create change, each one of us, um, by promoting decentralization, um, collaboration, and transparency. I talked a lot about trust, too, and accountability, just making sure you're accountable for your actions. Now, these values are drastically shifting our environment of business transactions, as well as how technology is used in our everyday life. It's going to get even more. But together, we can use it for good and, in, and construct the world that we want, which is equitable, um, that is embracing this historical cultural shift. I hope you'll join me on this shift. Thank you for joining me today. Yeah.